Well, good morning. How are you today? All right. Good deal. 11 o'clock, you're awake. I love that. I love that. Well, hey, this is that week in the year where we celebrate all the things that we are thankful for. And so how many of you were able to celebrate Thanksgiving with a sense of thankfulness this year? All right. All right. Yeah. Sometimes that's not always easy, is it? Sometimes it's hard to be thankful because life hurts and there's circumstances that hit us. And and I realize that. And so my hope today as is, is we go into our time of teaching is that I, I want to awaken us as followers of Jesus to what it is that he has done for us. And so for you, as a follower of Jesus, I want you to realize that you have reason to be thankful today regardless of life because of what he has done for you. And so let's jump into this and take a look at what we have been given because of Jesus. Let's take a look at the freedom we have as followers of Jesus because of what he's done for us. And so if you can get your message notes out, that's going to help you follow along as we get into this today. Be some verses we're going to look at. If you want to doodle and take notes, feel free to do that as well. But as we jump in, I want to remind us of some things about what it means that we have freedom as followers of Jesus. And so this would be the first thing I'd want us to focus on in our time today, is that because of Jesus, we have been given freedom. We have been given freedom from the penalty of sin. And now I know when, when somebody talks about that word sin in our culture today, it's so not a politically correct word, Right? And and like when someone starts to talk about the idea of sin, it's almost as if there's this perception in our culture that that person is a backwoods idiot who believes that the world is still flat, right? And so let me assure you that I do not believe that the world is flat, and I do not come from the backwoods. I come from suburbia. Whether or not I'm an idiot, that will remain to be seen, right? (laughs) But I think that we have such an issue with that word, and so let me step back and kind of unpack it for us a little bit so we can get over the issue we may have with the word. And let me give you another word that I think captures the essence of that word really well. And the other word would be this, dysfunctional. And I think that's a word we can all resonate with to one degree or another. And the interesting thing about somebody who is dysfunctional is that they are not being functional, right? They're not living life the way they were intended to live it. And so I think a good understanding of dysfunctionality is basically this. This is what dysfunction looks like. Anytime you do the wrong thing, you're being dysfunctional. Anytime you fail to do the right thing, you're being dysfunctional. Do you know any dysfunctional people in life? Yeah, we're laughing, right? How many of you have been that dysfunctional person in life? Yeah, failed to do the right thing or chose to do the wrong thing. And so the Bible has a very technical term for this. Do you know what it is? Sin. (laughs) And I don't think I have to convince you of the reality of sin in life because I think we are painfully aware of it whenever we encounter it and experience it from another person. Whenever somebody else's dysfunction disrupts our life, we know exactly what sin is. Because have you ever experienced somebody failing you in that they did not do the right thing by you? Have you experienced that in life? And have you ever experienced the dysfunction of another person when they have wronged you and damaged you? See, I don't think I need to convince you of the reality of it because we've all felt it. We've all experienced it. And here's the thing, when somebody else's dysfunction disrupts your life, when somebody else's dysfunction damages you, how do you respond to that? How many of you are like this when you experience someone else's dysfunction that harms you and damages you? How many of you are like, well, okay, maybe that's all right, I guess. Anyone respond that way? No. See, you respond the same way I respond when somebody's dysfunction damages your life. You want justice, right? You want someone to pay for the wrong that you have experienced. See, that's normal. That's what we all want when we experience dysfunction. Here's our our problem, though. 
let me shed some light on the extent of our dysfunctionality. (laughs) See, you and I want justice when wrong has been done to us. But guess what we don't want when we've been the ones who've done the wrong? We don't want justice given to us for the wrong that we've done. How dysfunctional is that, right? (laughs) And that's how messed up we are. And here's our dilemma as people, is that on the one hand, we desperately want a God who will deal with the dysfunction and the wrongs that have been done to us. But we ask this same God to turn a blind eye to our dysfunction and to let us off the hook. And when we do that, we're asking God to not be good because a good God does not turn a blind eye to dysfunction. A good God brings justice to the wrongs in this world. And that's the dilemma we have as a race, is that on the one hand, I want a God to be good enough to deal with dysfunction that I've experienced, the wrong that's been done to me. But if this God is good, he has to also deal with my dysfunction and the wrong that I've done. And so here's our dilemma. We want a God who's good, but at the same time, we're terrified of a God who would be good in that sense towards us. And there's a serious consequence for sin, for dysfunction in life. Paul writes in Romans 6.23, he says these words, he says, for the wages of sin is death. That the consequence for our dysfunction for walking away from God, for for shoving it in his face, for saying, I want life on my terms, the consequence for walking away from the one who is the source of all goodness, all truth, all beauty, all life, the consequence to that is separation, is death. And that's the essence of death, is that it means to be separated from. And when we did that as a race, we died, and that we are separated from God. And the beautiful thing about finding Jesus, or rather the beautiful thing about being found by Jesus, is that in him we find the one who is the ultimate expression of both God's love toward us and God's justice, in that someone has paid the price for our dysfunction. And I want you to see this, a couple of things in the Bible, they're on your message notes, a couple of passages that really speak of how Jesus is the ultimate demonstration of God's love for us despite our dysfunction. There in uh, Romans 5, 8, Paul writes these words. He says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still what? Sinners. Christ died for us. Stop and think about the implications of that statement. You and I do not love like this, do we? I will love you when you demonstrate to me that you are worthy of my love. And I'll probably love you most of the time, right? That's how we love. You're saying God loves radically different than us. God doesn't say, hey, when you've dusted yourself off, when you've cleaned yourself up, when you've gotten your act together, when you're all buttoned up, then I will love you. God says when you are as dysfunctional as you possibly can be, when you are hopeless, when there is no help that you can do for yourself, I will love you. And I will love you by sending someone to come for you. I'll send my own son. That's a radical kind of love. And that famous verse that's there in your notes, John 3, 16, where John says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes will not perish but have eternal life. So who is Jesus for? All of us. Whoever believes. And that's the hope that we have in being found by Jesus, that we realize that despite our dysfunction, we are incredibly loved by God. But here's the thing. Jesus is not just a demonstration of God's love toward us. He's also the ultimate expression of God's justice in our life. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them up to the New Testament book of Romans, Romans chapter 3. And I want you to see something that Paul writes here in this passage. And I think for many of us who have been Christians a long time, these words will be familiar to us, but I want to read a little bit deeper than maybe sometimes we normally read, and I want you to see something incredible about who Jesus is in our lives as we follow him. And so Romans 3, 21 through 26, this is what Paul writes. 
He writes, but now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. Okay, so let, let's unpack a couple of terms here so we understand what he's talking about. Paul's talking about righteousness. Righteousness basically means living life right according to God's design. We are all created to be righteous. We are all created to live life according to God's design. We went south once upon a time. And so now Paul is saying that there is a righteousness that comes from who? From God has now been given to us. And he says it's apart from law. In other words, it's not about trying to live up to the Old Testament commandments. That when God gave us the Ten Commandments, the purpose of those were not for us to somehow try to measure up and make ourselves righteous in God's sight. The purpose of those commandments was to show us how messed up we are that we can't measure up and to realize we need serious help. And the beautiful thing is that Jesus came to give us that help. And so he says, verse 22, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So how do we gain access to this righteousness from God? Through faith in Jesus. Through trusting what he has come to do for us. That he has done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And look at what he says. There is no difference. So amongst us, we're all in the same standing. And that's not how we'd like it to be, right? Because most of us would like to think that God's going to grade on a curve right? And it's going to line us up best to worst, and we're just hoping we're on the good side of that swing and the curve. And yet the reality is it doesn't matter best to worst. We're all being graded by the same standard. Are we like the one we were created to be like? And so he says, there is no difference for all have sinned, been dysfunctional, and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified. That means to be made right, to be declared not guilty are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And and so what is this righteousness? What is this grace? What does this redemption cost you? Nothing. What did it cost Jesus? Everything. He goes on in verse 25. God presented him, Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement. To make atonement means to pay the price. So Jesus paid the price for us. So he is a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. And God did this to demonstrate his what? Justice. Because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. So the time before Christ he hadn't really dropped the hammer. But now because of Christ he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. See, the hope we have as followers of Jesus is not simply that we are loved by God, but that in Jesus, someone has paid the price for our dysfunction. Justice has been paid in full for our sin. And men and women, what that means today is that we can stand before God and say, thank you that in Jesus I have been set free from the penalty of my dysfunction. That means that when Jesus went to to the cross for you, He paid the price for everything you have done in life. And I don't know when the last time was that you thought about everything. But it's pretty significant, isn't it? It's significant. And yet the hope that we have as followers of Jesus is that he has set us free from the penalty of our everything. That when we come to him, We surrender our life to him and he takes our life with him on the cross and gives us new life, the life he died to give us, which means that you and I have reason to be thankful today as followers of Jesus because we've been set free from the penalty of our sin. And I know on a weekend like this, Many of you are probably visiting us because it's a holiday weekend, so you're visiting with family and friends. And and so perhaps some of you, you haven't been to church in a really long time, and and maybe you were wondering as you were coming here today, hey, am I really going to fit in with these people, with these churchy people that seem to have it all together? Like, will 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 I stand out? Will they see that I have issues? Is is this going to be a problem? And let me just tell you something. We know you have issues. (laughs) Because we have issues, Right? And if you are worried about fitting in today, let me tell you who we are. We are a band of misfits <laughs> who are figuring out together what it means to live in the freedom Jesus has given us. 
And if that's something you want more of, hang out with us some more. And we'll do our best to point you to him because he is the one who will give you the same freedom we're experiencing. And so welcome. You're going to fit right in. But the amazing thing about following Jesus is that he has not simply set us free from the penalty of sin. He has also set us free from the power of sin in our lives. I don't know if you realize this, but as a follower of Jesus, you have been given something incredible that you did not have prior to following him. He has come to give you freedom. He's come to set you free from the power of dysfunction, from the power of sin in your life. And I think a lot of times we misunderstand what it means to have true freedom. Here's how I think our culture would probably define freedom if we were just to ask our average friend, hey, what do you think it looks like to have freedom? I think this is probably how we would define freedom. Freedom means having the power or the ability to do whatever I want. And if I can have that, then I will be truly free. Now let me ask you a question. When was the last time you did whatever you wanted and it led you to a good place? <laughs> right? I mean, how many, of you, how many of you just embrace whatever you want? It's my life, I'll do what I want. And it led you to happy, healthy relationships. Or did it lead you to broken relationships? How many of you did whatever you wanted? It's my dime, it's my money, and it led you to financial freedom versus debt, right? See, exercising your power to do whatever you want does not lead you to freedom. It leads you to bondage. In fact, you know what happens when a society decides that we're all going to do whatever we want? You know what you get? Anarchy. That's not freedom. And our culture doesn't even buy into that ultimately because if we bought into that as the definition of freedom, why do we take some people's freedom away and put them in prison? Because we don't want them doing that, right? That is not what true freedom is. That is not the freedom he came to give you. This is what true freedom is. True freedom is having the power and the ability to do what is right, to do what is good, even when you don't want to. And that is the power he is giving you to be able to do the right thing, the good thing for the first time in your life. You know why you don't have this power and ability apart from him? Because in and of yourself, how many times do you not do the right thing or the good thing? Right? I mean, have you ever experienced this? You saw what the right thing was. You saw what the good thing was. And in and of yourself, you felt like you wanted to do it, but you just found that it was beyond your reach. It was beyond your ability to do it. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever experienced that? Or how many of you have seen the wrong thing and you know this is wrong? You know you're not supposed to do this, but in and of yourself, you do not have the power or the ability to say no to it. And yet what he has come to do is to set you free and give you the power you didn't have on your own to give you the power to live the life you were created to live, to live the life he set you free to live. And so here's the amazing thing about Jesus, is that in him we have been given everything we need. Look at what Peter writes about this there on your message notes. 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4. This is what Peter says about understanding who Jesus is. And so he writes this. He says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Stop and think about what Peter just said. That as a follower of Jesus, you have been given everything you need to live the life you've been set free to live. Do you realize that? Do you realize that? That because of him at work in your life, you have everything you need. Now, I love that Peter says everything you need and not everything you want. (laughs) Because, man, I have a shopping list. Hey, God, would you sign off on all this? (laughs) And God's like, no, because that's not what you need. But I've given you everything you need to live the life I've set you free to live. And so he says his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him, through knowing him, who called us by his own glory and goodness, not ours, but his. Through these, through his glory and goodness, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. See, he's given you the power you don't have in and of yourself. 
If you have your Bibles open still in Romans, flip to the right a little bit. And I want you to look at something Paul writes in Romans chapter 6 about this idea of the freedom we have because of the power we've been given in Jesus. In Romans 6, verse 8, this is what Paul writes. He says, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And so in that one little verse, Paul is really pointing out the, what the Christian life is all about now. Is that when we recognize our need for rescue, when we recognize our need for Jesus, we come to him and say, would you take this messed up life and would you pay the price and give me new life? And so he takes us with him to the cross pays the price for our dysfunction, and then he raises us up with him coming out of the grave so that we experience the new life he's come to give us. It's why as Christians, one of the first steps of obedience we take is being baptized, because baptism is a symbol of what Paul's talking about right here. That when we're baptized, we go under the waters, and it's a symbol of dying to our old life. And we come up out of the waters, and it's a symbol of embracing the new life that he's come to give us. And so he says, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. Think about that for a minute. What's our greatest fear as mortal beings? Dying. And so then Jesus comes down for us and goes to the cross to pay the price for us. And Satan wields the greatest weapon he knows of and he tries to have the Son of God killed off not realizing that this was God's plan. And so Satan has Jesus killed thinking, hey, I won. And then three days later, Jesus comes back from the dead and says, is that all you got? (laughs) Is that all you got? And if he has power over death, don't you think he has power over your dysfunction? If you'll walk with him and follow him and let let, let him lead you into freedom. And so he says, the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. Do you understand what Paul is saying? That as a follower of Jesus, you've been given power that you didn't have in and of yourself. Exercise your freedom as you follow him. And the hope that you and I have is that this is not dependent upon us to do it. It's dependent upon him to do it in us. Look at these other references there in your message notes. This is Paul writing in 2 Corinthians 1, 21 through 22. He says, now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. So who does that? God. Do you understand how good good that news is for you? (laughs) Because if it was dependent upon you or myself to do that, it would never happen. But who's the one who's doing it in us? He is. It is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And then look at how Jude puts this here in Jude 24 through 25, this small little letter in your New Testament. It's right before the book of Revelation. I'm not making it up. (laughs) He, he, He wraps up his letter with these words, Jude 24 through 25. To him who is able to keep you from what? From falling and to present you before his glorious presence without what? Without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. You understand that you've been given power that you never had because of the freedom he's given you. And so now let me pause here because some of us might be thinking like, now Joel, are you saying that that in the Christian journey I'll reach a point of sinless perfection in this lifetime? I don't know, maybe like for five minutes you might get there if you're sleeping, right? (laughs) And see, your laughter betrays you because you've followed Jesus long enough to know that you still wrestle with your issues and 
And, and so let me unpack some terms that help you understand what it is that God has doing, what God is doing, and what God is yet to do in your life. And one of the words, the first, words, first word I want to give you is this word called justification. It's a word we've already seen in Paul's writing. Justification means to be declared not guilty, to be declared right before God. That is what Jesus has done for us when we enter into life with him, when we accept the, the grace that he's given us. That in God's sight, we are now justified because of what Jesus has done for us. That means that we no longer stand before God guilty, we stand before God holy, righteous, perfect because of what Jesus has done for us. The end game in this is that there will come a day where God is going to wrap everything up. Either he's going to call us home or he's going to come down and fix it all. One of the two is going to happen. And when that day comes, he's going to bring us into his presence, and that is called glorification. That time where we enter into the presence of God and we, we are made right, we are made perfect forever because of him at work in us. And the beautiful thing about that day is that we will be in his presence and we will be set free from the presence of sin. But we live in between our justification and our hope of glorification. And in a world that's saturated with the presence of sin, we wrestle with our issues. And what God is doing in the middle time right now is what is called sanctification. And to be sanctified means to be set apart for God in this world. And what that means is that God is taking us and transforming us and changing us from the inside out to be more like Jesus, more like the one who's come to rescue us. And the more you walk with Jesus, the more you follow him, the more you experience the freedom he came to give you. But let me ask you a question. Those of you that have been a Christian for, for a while now, let's just say maybe five-ish years or longer, are you realizing just how much a piece of work you really are compared to when you first came to Christ? I mean, are you realizing this? Like you're just realizing how deep your dysfunction goes? And yet the beautiful thing about following Jesus is I think that when we first come to him and we first realize our need for him, he does not peel back the layers of the onion all at once. We would be so undone if he did that, right? I think we, we realize that we're messed up enough that I need help and he comes and he pours his love out on us and Jesus says, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, now follow me. And as we follow him, he leads us into new freedom as he begins to show us the dysfunction and set us free from it. And, and so let, let me just give you a few, a few tips on how to cooperate in this process with him as you go through life. This, this is on your notes. This is for free. You can just write this down if you want. <laughs> but if we want to experience the freedom he's come to give us and experience his power at work within us, I think there's a few things that we need to be willing to be. And here's the first thing I think we need to be willing to be. We need to be honest. Be honest with ourselves and be honest with him about what those issues and struggles are in our life. And your issues and struggles may not be mine, but we all have them. And so the person who says they have nothing to hide is a person who's living in denial. <laughs> the beautiful thing about being a follower of Jesus is that I suddenly realize I have no reason to hide any longer because I'm living in his grace. And there are going to be times in your life where Jesus is going to call you to look in the mirror and look at yourself in the mirror and show you things about yourself that you may not want to see. But the beautiful thing about standing there with him next to you is you're standing with the one who's paid the price for it all. And so he's going to want to draw you to the mirror and say, let's take a look at this area of your life. And okay, you see this issue? You see the struggle over here? Let's deal with that because I paid the price for that. Okay, you see this over here? I know this hurts, but do you see this over here? Let's deal with that because I paid the price for that. And there's something over here you're not ready for yet, but we'll get there in time. And when we get there, I know it's going to hurt, but trust me, I'm really good at dealing with this because I paid the price for that. We can stand there and look at the mirror with him next to us without fear, without shame, because we know he's dealt with it already. And so we have to be honest about our issues and struggles and let him work in us and lead us into freedom. The second thing that we need to be willing to be then is not just to be honest, but we have to be willing to be wise about how we live life now. Because all of us are going to have those areas of weakness, those things that we're susceptible to, which means that we have to be wise about it and not live like idiots <laughs> in our areas of weakness, thinking that somehow, hey, I can go here and deal with this and it's not going to be a problem for me. Yes, it will. Two friends walking down the street. 
both of them recovering alcoholics, doing life together. And they don't have a lot of money on them, and it's the middle of the day, they're really hungry, and they see a sign out in front of a bar that they're walking next to, and the sign says, free lunch with purchase of beer. Dilemma. Because they're really hungry. And so they stand outside debating, and one of them says, like, look, we'll just go in, we'll have the one beer, we'll get our free lunch, maybe God's hooking us up, this could be a great thing. And the other one's just like, you know, I don't think that's good, I don't think it's a good choice for us. And so they have this debate, and one goes in and gets his free lunch, and the other walks away hungry question. Which of them was weak? Trick question. They're both weak, right? They both have the same weakness. Which of them was wise? The one that walked away hungry. And if we're going to begin to live wise about the areas of our weakness, that means that we may have to choose to give up certain freedoms today in order to gain a greater freedom tomorrow. And so you may have to let go of the things that are your weaknesses or your issues and say, God, I'm going to surrender this and walk away from it so that I can experience the freedom you have for me. But not only do we need to be honest, not only do we need to be wise, we need to be open. And by that I mean we need to walk openly with others who know us, that know the good, the bad, and the ugly, and love us anyways, and are willing to challenge us and encourage us on the journey. And so when I say be open, I'm not talking about posting your, your, your junk up on Facebook, right? That's not what I mean. I mean, that's just people will comment. No one's going to help you, right? I'm talking about walking openly with people who are going to help you. See, there, there's times in my life, in my weaknesses, in my struggles, where I'm going to need to reach out to the people in my life and say, I need your strength to help me in this season. Can I lean on you and will you walk with me? And there's going to be times where there are going to be people in your life who are going to need to rely on you, on your strength to help them. But if we're walking openly with one another, we'll experience the freedom together he wants to lead us into. And so this is what it looks like. This is what it means to be set free. Is that you've been set free from the penalty of sin. And he is setting you free from the power of sin as you follow him. But there's more. Freedom means so much more than that. Because not only have we been set free from the penalty of sin and the power of sin, we have been set free for. And before we fill in that blank, I want to pause and just highlight something significant to understand as followers of Jesus. You see, we have been given freedom, and the freedom we've been given is so much more than just what we've been set free from. Do you understand that you have been set free for a purpose in this life? And as amazing as it is to realize what we've been set free from, I mean, that's why we sing these epic songs like Amazing Grace and all that God has done for us. As amazing as that is, you understand that that's just the beginning of the freedom he's come to give you. He's come to set you free for a reason in this world. And we need to understand that if we're going to fully experience the freedom he's come to give us. And so why do you think you have been set free as a follower of Jesus? Do you think it's to live for yourself in that freedom or to live for the one who set you free? Let me tell you, it can't be to live for yourself because that's how we got in trouble in the first place, right? And so to understand what it means to be set free for something, we have to realize that it means that we've been set free to live for him. But here's the thing for you. I cannot fill this blank in for your life. That's what you have to discover as a follower of Jesus. You have to understand that the adventure in following him is realizing what he has set you free for in this world. What I can do is paint the big picture for you in this moment and to tell you that it's to live for him, but specifically what that looks like is what the adventure for you is all about. And if you want to experience what he set you free for, you need to pursue him and follow him and listen to him so that you realize what you've been set free for. I can tell you what that blank is not about. So let me do that for a second. Let me burst some bubbles today, but it's for your good, so just hang on. <laughs> so you have not been set free so that you can live for your dreams. I know that's hard to hear as Americans, right? <laughs> because we're living for the American dream, and yet God has not set you free. Jesus has not come to give you freedom so that you can live for your dreams. And let me tell you two simple reasons why. 
The first reason why you have not been set free to live for your dream is this. Your dreams are about the wrong person. Who are your dreams about? Who? Yourself. Yes, same as my, my, my dreams aren't about you, but I mean, same thing for me, right? <laughs> like, like my dreams are all about me. And if we're living for our dreams, we're living for the wrong person. Look at what Paul writes about this in Galatians 5.13 there on your notes. He says, You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Do not use your freedom to live for yourself. He says, Rather, serve one another in love, that you've been set free to live for someone other than yourself. Here's the second reason why you have not been set free to live for your dreams. Your dreams for your life are way too small. See, God has epic dreams for your life. Do you really think he set you free so you can live for yourself? And here's how you can know this is true, that the dreams we have for ourselves are way too small. Look at the people in our culture who have had all their dreams come true, who have affluence, who have stuff, who have power, who have everything they could ever hope for, does the fulfillment of all their dreams lead them to contentment, joy, and fulfillment? Absolutely not. If that was the case, we wouldn't have our tabloids, right? We have tabloids because we're fascinated with the people that have it all and yet seem so empty. Learn from them. See, God has not given you freedom so that you could waste it for something as insignificant as living for your dreams. He set you free so that you can begin to discover what it is he set you free for. And God has not freed you so that you can go around life feeling good about yourself. God has freed you so you can stop being obsessed with yourself and start living for something that matters. Start living for him. Men and women, he wants to lead you into a new kind of freedom like you've never known. A freedom that gives you purpose for life. And so how do you discover what that blank is? How do you discover it in your life? Well, here's part of it. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18. He kind of gives us a little insight here in this passage. He writes these words. He says, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. You see, you've been set free to become like him. The one in whose image you were created. The one you were created to be like. And what Paul says is that we're to reflect his glory in this world. You understand that God created us to reflect his beauty, his truth, his goodness in this world around him. And now that we've been set free, he wants to reorient our lives back around him. Because you are never more free than when you are being the person you were created to be. You are never more free than when you are being like Jesus. And that's what he wants to lead you into. And so how do you figure out what this blank is for your life? How do you figure out what it means to be set free, what you've been set free for? Let me give you a couple of thoughts to help you wrestle with this in your own journey. The first thing I would recommend that you start doing is this, is that you start asking God to awaken his desires for your life within you. That you just go before him and say, God, would you show me what it is you've set me free for in this world? Would you awaken your desires for my life within me. And to do that, you have to be willing to die to yourself so that you can be made to live for him. And that's hard, but if you trust him, he'll lead you into it. See, if you want to experience all that God has for you, you have to be willing to embrace everything he wants from you. And if you let him, he'll teach you how to do that. But the second thing that you need to start doing is this, that as you're asking him to awaken his desires for your life within you, the second thing is this, do something, do anything until it clicks, whatever it is for your life. 
See, I think one of the mistakes that we make as followers of Jesus and trying to understand what we've been set free for is that we'll say, okay, God, show me. Hit me with it. Come on, God. Bring it to me. Let's go. Come on. And then we just sit here week after week after week not doing anything. And we can go years without ever experiencing what God has set us free for because we're unwilling to move. And yet what God would maybe want you to do is to start doing something until he stirs your heart in response to whatever that is. And there's a reason why you have to start doing something as a follower of Jesus if you want to discover what you've been set free for. Let me tell you a secret about life. Action awakens desire. Action awakens desire. About a month ago, I went to the doctors and kind of had that that pseudo-physical where you stand on that special scale that shoots the electricity through your body And it kind of gives you your your body mass, weight, ratio, index. I don't know, all these confusing numbers, but it basically says not good at the end of the paper, right? (laughs) And and, and so I remember holding this paper, and I'm like, oh, this this is one of those times where the truth hurts, but hopefully it's going to hurt me for my good. And so about a month ago, I just made a painful decision in my life. I need to start running. (laughs) And the motivation for me in seeing these results was to realize that if I want to take care of the body God has given me and to maximize the longevity of it so that I can make the impact he wants me to make in this world, I have to actually embrace physical discipline as a spiritual discipline. And I was like, God, why do you have to make that so painfully clear? I was happy. (laughs) And so it it all got thrown off this week. I'll I'll start up again next week because of Thanksgiving, right? But (laughs) but three weeks ago, I got up in in the morning and started running. You know what the amazing thing was? The discovery I made after about two weeks into this? I hate running. <laughs> I know some of you, you just run, like you got designed you like a gazelle, and so it's like, yay, let's do it. I'm like, that, that's just not me. But you know what has been interesting to realize about two or three weeks into this? Is that though I hate doing it, something happens along the way once I start engaging in it, as I start running Suddenly, like, I'm awakened to the desire to enjoy this, and I'm seeing the sunrise for the first time in years. Like, I've never seen it, and I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool to be out here. And I'm realizing something, that oftentimes I have to make the choice to do it, despite how I feel about it. And so I have these debates with myself in the morning. I wake up, and it's early morning, and it's like, hey, self, wouldn't it just be awesome to lay here a couple more hours? Oh, that would feel so good. Hey, but self, we need to get in shape. So self, why don't you get out there and start running? Because I don't want to. But self, what have we been discovering? That when we get out there and make the choice, something comes alive in us. Don't you want that? I guess. (laughs) Self, get out of bed. And here's what I've become smart enough to realize. That if I will just make the choice, I will experience the awakening of desire after the choice has been made. And here's why this is true for the spiritual journey. Because wherever you go, action requires investment on your part. And where you invest your life, your heart will follow. So this is exactly what Jesus was talking about there in your message notes in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. And he was talking about where you invest your life, your treasure, here on earth or up in heaven. And so he says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, where you invest your life is where you find your heart. And if you want to discover what this blank is for you, start doing something until it clicks, until you realize what it is. And I've had the pleasure of walking with many of you long enough to see you discover what this blank is in your life. I know that there are some of you who have left your fingerprints in the lives of others on the other side of the globe because once upon a time you were bored, I don't know why, but you signed up to go on this mission trip and while you were over there, God awakened you to the reality of something he had for you and you realized this is why I have been set free. 
See, some of you have responded to the needs we've had as a church to help love on different people in different contexts. And so some of you signed up to serve with our kids' classes, even though you're like, I don't know anything about kids, and I guess if there's a need, I'll step into it. And you've done it long enough to suddenly realize that God wants to use you to shape the hearts of our kids and to show them how great his love is for them. And for you, you realize this is why I have been set free. See, in this series that we've been in, in the assignment, as we've gone through this together as a church, We've been awakening to this reality that maybe God has a one life for you, somebody he wants you to start investing in, to have significant relationship when not, with, not just to have a notch in your belt, but someone to truly care about for the purpose of sharing Jesus with them at some point in time. And as you've started to love on them, God's awakening within you a desire to share him with people in your life, and you realize, this is why I've been set free. See, men and women, you've been set free for a purpose. And as you follow him, he'll lead you into what that is. But if you're bored as a Christian today, that is totally on you. God is too amazing, too epic to ever be boring. And he has set you free for a purpose. And so my hope for you today as followers of Jesus is that you realize that today, regardless of the circumstances of life, you have reason to be thankful today because he has set you free. He set you free from the penalty of sin. He's setting you free from the power of sin and he's setting you free to discover the purpose he's called you to live in this world. And so my prayer is that as we continue As a church, as we go forward from this place, we will continually seek him to awaken us to what it is he has for us in life. And so as we go into this final song together, I I want to encourage you to let this song really help shape the prayer of your heart in this time. I want to encourage you to go before God and say, God, would you awaken within me what it means to be set free by you, what it means to live in the freedom you've come to give me. And so would you stand and pray with me as we go into this time? And so Lord, we want to come before you in this place, together gathered as your church in your name. We want to ask that you would awaken us to what it is that you have set us free for. And that God, for those of us who maybe needed reminding today, we'd realize that we've been set free from the penalty of our sin, that we don't have to hang our head around you. We can lift up our eyes and declare your greatness because you've loved us and set us free. And in this place, would you awaken us to the freedom that you've come to give us from our dysfunction and from our issues? Would you lead us into that freedom as we trust you and follow you? And here in this place, would you awaken us to the freedom you have for us, for what it is that you've set us free for in this world. So we want to come into this moment and to give you our worship. We want to give you our gifts and our offerings as an act of worship and declaring that we trust you more than we trust this. And so God, would you meet with us in this time? Would you meet with us in this moment? And would you awaken us to who you are and all that it is that you have for us? Amen.